Previously on Anything Goes. Uh, coming up. In- <laughs> <laughs> well, back to me. Back to okay, me. Okay, go do um, So you're going back to Just for Laughs this summer, are you not? Yes, I am. And you're doing your one woman show there, right? I am doing a one woman show. I hate to say what. I'm just doing a comedy show, and comedy it's me, show. and it's an hour. Okay. When you say one woman, it's like sounds like I'm going to talk about how I survived breast cancer. And well, it's going to be musical. But I still, no, I still love Dave's joke. Do your joke. The, the comment about if you're standing and like a one one man show. If you're standing, it's uh, oh, if if you're standing, it's stand up comedy. But if you're sitting down, it's an evening with. Yeah. <laughs> <It's like>, oh. <laughs> I hey, I, I wouldn't even show up to that, and I'm on it. That but. is really funny. It's an evening with Dean's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Now, is this the I'm same I'm sitting show? in a wheelchair, and I'm telling rape jokes. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> one hour. Oh, man. <laughs> Whoa. I hope there's some pamphlets on the I way out. I want to make Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And now, let's get to a new exciting show. Don't touch that dial. It was molested and it brings back horrible memories. This is anything. Frost. How the fuck am I funny? Dave Martin. What have we got here? A fucking comedian. And Kathleen McGee. And I'll execute every motherfucking last one of you. Can you dig it? Did I ever tell you the story about meeting Weird Al? Uh, so it, it was I think so. the year, like, I don't even know what year it was. I was in this competition for the funniest comic in Canada. So it was sometime in the mid 90s. And Weird Al was up for the Toronto Comedy Festival. And we were at this giant five level bar, and each floor was a different kind of comedy. And, uh, like, you know, sketch, improv, then stand up, and then other things. And uh, they had, like, a rooftop patio party that was like if you didn't want to watch comedy just get free drinks you went up there so weird Al was up there and dan quinn who's based out of vancouver now uh, i think at the time i'm not sure if he was in edmonton or whatever but um he was repping the west coast anyways he runs up to weird Al and just starts yelling you're better than the beatles man you're better than the beatles <laughs> now i didn't know if he was being serious or like you know taking shots like because he was drunk and Weird Al didn't know either, so it was really fucking weird. It was a funny little story, but he just kept on saying it. Weird Al was kind of like, that's great, and I'm just going to walk over here. <laughs> he just kind of walks off. Like, I couldn't ever, like, I could never be that crazy. I Like, I'm, I'm always way too embarrassed when I meet famous people, and, like, I'm, I don't want to, I could never be that person that, like, freaks out and says that <laughs> over and over. Right, it's, right. It, it's, it's just too awkward. I'm too awkward myself. <laughs> But I just, I never want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's... Well, who's the most like famous I, person you've met, Kathleen? Uh, I don't that's know. Not, that's not a stand-up comic. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, Tom Cruise? Probably. He was at my Starbucks one. Okay. But the other day, I was at the dog park with uh, with my dogs, and Eugene likes to carry, like, giant sticks. Like, he's a 12-pound dog, and he likes yep. to carry sticks. My dog, are, like, too. Yep, yep. 10 times his size and so he's walking along with this stick and this guy looks at him he goes holy that's a big stick for a little dog and i was like just like haha yeah and i looked at him i was like i think that was connor mcdavid from the oilers and then i heard him call his dog's name and i looked it up on instagram and it was him but i i knew i knew it was him because the way he looked at me like he looked at me like he was bracing himself right to be recognized Right. Oh. And like, I just saw that look in his eyes and I'm like, you know, I just like, I don't feel like going up to a person who's just trying to live their life. And like, even right. if it was somebody that I really wanted to meet, I think like the only person I would ever do that to is Taylor Swift. Cause she seems like she's cool with that kind of stuff. Right. But, but I just like, I like, I didn't, I knew I was pretty sure it was him, but I, I just couldn't see myself freaking out and be like, Oh, can I have a picture? <laughs> it's just, but some people weren't really good at doing that kind of stuff. I'm at the Rolling Stones and uh, uh, be it like a, it was a, uh, a radio contest and we got to go backstage and we Ooh, got- Was it exciting? Was uh, it like on a movie set exciting? I don't know if it was like a movie. I, I, well, the whole thing was all very surreal. Like, it really, it's like this, yeah, I didn't have time to really take it all in, but yeah, it was, uh, um, I guess uh, Q107 had tickets to give away and Christine Von Hagen and I had tickets to go and see the Stones that night. And they were giving away front row tickets. Uh, and the thing was, you had to have a Rolling Stones tattoo. 
Right. And so this would have been like, oh, I guess like uh, 98 or something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, then she, uh, so, um, and Rolling and Christine has a Rolling Stones tattoo on her ankle of just the tongue and the, the lips. And uh, so then it turned out that nobody had a Rolling Stones tattoo. And then so the radio station changed it to, uh, you just have to have the Rolling Stones written on you somewhere. So people were just getting markers, but she actually had it and she showed up. And uh, and then they when they drew the tickets, the first guy wasn't there. And so I, I just was yelling at this van, you know, they had the portable radio station van outside right. of this room. And then, um, was it this kind of, this, uh, Oh, it might have been at Air Canada Center. But then we, so, uh, as soon as the DJ guy had uh, had trouble reading the name Christine, uh, I knew it was her. And uh, so then she goes in, we get the tickets, we go backstage, and there's two uh, in this big room. And, of course, they had, like, free Heineken and Corona. And so I just start drinking as fast as I can. <laughs> and we were supposed to get a, a picture with them, too. And when they came in, they, they've done this, like, with military precision. They just come in, and then just they... You know, get in front of the crowd and bing bing, and then move to the other side where the other contest winners or industry people were. Right, right. Bing bing, and then they're gone. But uh, I just remember them having gigantic heads, like they look like apple dolls, <laughs> sort of. Yep, like yeah, yeah. they're not young; they look like apple dolls, but massive, massive heads on these sort of tiny little bodies. And uh, uh, so you actually met the bobbleheads. You didn't actually meet the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was just guys, their was just guys in suits. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must have told you the time I met Sticks, right? Uh, oh, uh, was this? Uh, no. I met, I've met I've met Stick tw Sticks twice, and my whole thing is whenever I meet anyone in rock and roll, I don't really care. It's not that I don't like their band or whatever, but I always try to fuck with them because it's like a funnier story than just be like, "Hey, you're great." So the first time I was with Glenn Ottaway, a comedian, and we were in this long line, and Sticks is all in a row, and Glenn is good friends with Lawrence Gowan, who's now the singer, and you know, so he goes, Glenn goes first, and then I put that stupid look on my face, like oh, like this, and every time I shake each person's hand in the band, um, I go, sometimes I don't wear pants. That's the only thing I said to each one. So they kind of like looking at Glenn and then looking at me. And then they're like, oh, you're like Glenn's special friend. <laughs> you're a make a wish. Yeah. Like, you know, so I'm like, sometimes I don't wear pants. And they're like, great. Okay, good. Yep. Okay. Sometimes I don't wear pants. And it was, that was the first time. And then the second time I got a picture with the guitarist. His name is JT. He's got long hair, a big mustache, big beard or whatever, big mustache. And as I'm shaking his hand in the picture, I go, man, I fucking loved you in Lion King. <laughs> and he's just got this look of like, whoa, whoa, in the picture? And then I just fucked off. I just like got the picture? Whoa, let's go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Are there people? We're having an open one tonight, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are going to come in. Casey Corbin's going to come at 915. It's recording now. Oh, shit. <laughs> Get that. Uh, hi, I'm Christine Von Hagen, comic extraordinaire. You're listening to Laugh Attack. No. Listen to shit. Hi, this is Christine Von Hagen. I'm a comic, and you're listening to Anything Goes with Darren Frost, also Kathleen and Dave, on XM Radio. Lucky you. I, and we also, one of the prizes you got for getting these front row tickets to the Rolling Stones was you got your okay. picture with them. And I was like shit boyfriend number one because a good boyfriend would have grabbed his girlfriend and like put her out front. And But all these people gathered in front of us and like you can kind of see my head and you can see about a quarter of Christine's head, which is, I felt like such a shithead after that. But but then we get, the front, <laughs> we, we get the front row tickets and then we go and sit down and of course she's telling this to every, like all these other Rolling Stones fans, we just want our tickets. And I was sort of like, maybe don't tell the people that yeah. might have paid two grand. Right. And, uh, we just got ours for free. And uh, our tickets were supposed to be way up there and they were going to be shit. But, um, I don't know. Anybody spends $2,000 to go to a concert. I don't care about their feelings. <laughs> I don't care. That's I crazy. Agree. I agree. Like, I, I, even like when they had the Olympics uh, in Vancouver and, um, they had the gold medal hockey game or whatever. Right. Adam's Adam's dad went. He but like he could have sold those tickets for like 
thousands of dollars. People right. were paying thousands of dollars to go. And I'm, and he did say like being there was such an incredible feeling, like maybe for something like that once in a lifetime thing, but just to see a band that you like and maybe meet them for two seconds, like I can't justify that. Yeah, no. I don't understand the paid meet and greet. I just don't, I don't get it. Like meeting them by chance, fine. Or if you have a connection, fine. But paying all that money for it, it's just, uh, yeah, to be the 87th person to say, you guys are fucking great. I, it's just not a real thing for me. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, no, I don't understand. And you you saw that Russell Peters meet and greet, you know, it's like yeah. Remember that? It was just like just a chain of people and you're just sort of like that's so not a real connection with them. I guess people He's get, actually he's actually very like I I've done meet and greets with him and he's he takes time with everyone. I was gonna say that not like a lot of times I saw it, yeah. He's great at those. Like I mean, it's it's they're exhausting. I did one with him, um, and it's like you're just smiling the whole time and you're just like being as nice and, th and you have to be thankful. I mean, like he's a millionaire because people come and right. see his shows. So, but he's like, he did not just power through people. Like he actually spent time with everybody and it was like, it was pretty, it was pretty cool to watch. And he knew people like what, some people showed up and he's like, oh yeah, Mississauga, 1996. I remember you. And he knew their name. I'm like, how the fuck do you do? Well, the, time, the time I hung out with him in Victoria with my friend, Brian, it was literally like he was like, "Let let's go and do this." Like he didn't have he didn't have a handler to tell him that he was like, "We're doing this first. And me and Brian had to wait like an hour, and I think it was like an hour, hour and a half, which is fine. I, I had no problem. But he didn't be like, "Oh, I'll get to it when I get to it." He's like, "No, we're fucking doing this kind of attitude." And he went and he spent a lot of time. And I watched him with all the groups spending time. But that's so how I, you build a fan base. Yeah. That's how you build right. a fan base. You you actually treat your fans like humans. Right. <laughs> what? Come on. I know, right? <laughs> but I also don't think people paid for it. I think these were winners. Oh yeah. And things. Yeah. So yeah. it's that's also a, a different situation. Um, uh, but some bands they can't even they can't go on the road unless they have those meet and greets because that's how they make their money now. Because of obviously record sales. I mean, we can talk about that till we're blue in the face or gone. This they yeah. all said it. They don't want to charge, but if they don't, they're not touring. Yeah, I know. The I, whole, yeah, the whole uh, well it's the streaming has just killed everything, so Right. Yeah, it's like you don't make money from album sales anymore. Um, I got to go to a Foo Fighters concert and go backstage with yeah. Claire Brousseau. And I, I didn't even get to, like, we didn't meet the Foo Fighters. I, they just walked past us. and uh, But I did meet Bubbles from the Trailer Park Boys. But I didn't know it was him because he didn't have his yeah, right. <laughs> And uh, I was like, he, he's either Glenn Humphrey from the Tom Green show or he's Bubbles. I didn't know which one. I right. didn't think it was like, I don't know if Glenn Humphrey was like a very kind thing. <laughs> well, you know, like, yeah. Tom Green and, and Glenn Humphrey don't talk anymore. I think he, I think he used his friends for too many pranks or played too many, one too many pranks on him. And I think that when Glenn realized, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to be famous. I'm not in show business. This was fun for a while. I, I think, like, I think Tom Green, like, put his, pardon? Did he make money, though? He had to have made some money. I, I think some, but not enough to, like, put up with, you know, getting your phone number placed in front of Times Square for people yeah. to throw your luggage out of a helicopter or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, oh, Dave Grohl's supposed to be the nicest guy to run into, though. You know, he's supposed to be, if you ever run into yeah. him, I, I've, I've, I've only heard, like, good sort of rumors about, uh, I don't know why I said rumors like that, but uh, okay. Well, here, well, we're, it's nine fifteen. We're doing an open show. Okay. Uh, your buddy Scott is here again, and Jeff. So we'll let both of these people in, and uh, here we go. Well, this will be good because Scott knows Geoff, and Geoff knows Scott. This is oh, like, cute! A connection might happen. This, this is, you know. <laughs> All right, there's uh, there's Scott, and we're waiting for hey, Geoff. Guys. Oh, Geoff's coming in. Nice. is coming in. Oh, Brock Maybe. reunion. Is a little oh. Brock University reunion. Oh, Brock, how may, uh, how I bombed up on your stage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all? Uh, is, Brock, oh. is Brock in Brampton? No, it's in St. Catharines. St. Catharines. When, oh, you first doing, when you first start doing comedy and you think that you're going to be playing in colleges... You know, if you're in your 20s and you're sort of like, and you never really partied much in college like I did, or with popular, with other, you know what I'm saying. But so, 
uh, yeah, you get this, oh man, I'm going to do some college gigs and oh, it's going to be crazy. I'm going to party. And then, uh, and then that never happens. And you got to realize how, what an age difference there is between like 28 or 27 <laughs> and like 22, you know? And so. Well, actually, Ricky Bronson once said to me something really funny about colleges. He said, it's great while you look like you're old enough to party with them. But mm -hmm. the second that you look like you're old enough to drive them home in a minivan, you got to stop doing colleges. Yeah, I, I, that's, I, that's I, what Ricky once said. And I, you know what? I, I, I agreed with him because I have played colleges after that age of like, I should be driving these kids home. And, you know, you do it for the money and you try to get some laughs. And there are sometimes they can be great audiences. But at the end of the day, you're like, you know what? Younger comics should be doing these gigs. Well, yes, yeah, so at least a little bit more <laughs> relatable. You know, I mean, I, I did my last one with Jean Paul. And John Paul was, well, and you know what? I and mean, he was doing great with it, though. I don't know. It's, uh, he was doing, telling stories about, like, wine and cheese parties to these college kids. Right. And I'm starting, you know, but anyways, I, I uh, but I remember after the show, there were, like, two guys who were like, hey, man, you want to come to our dorm and, uh, and, and do some bong rips? And I was just like, no, no, I, I don't. And then I just had a moment of, like, I guess this is it. I committed to <laughs> my last college show because I was just not connecting and uh kathleen kathleen's like where's this gig <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still like where's this gig yeah <laughs> all right well casey corbin wants to come in okay so kick off see off. let him try to come in another time hey i'm we'll in talk. yeah we oh, need to turn your camera on I don't, know, I, I don't know what's going on <laughs> <laughs> typical job know. take take a fucking computer course Hey, I've been looking at a computer screen for friggin' two weeks straight, man. My eyeball yeah. crazy. I know you're a teacher, you know, boo. -hoo. I know. Have you yeah. taken have you taken off your uh, masturbation tape off the yeah. camera thing? I, I can't <laughs> after my name it says the name of my school here, so I hope this doesn't get back to them somehow. In what way? Uh I don't know, that they know that they can hear me talking to you guys. <laughs> What you're, what you're saying all right well we're gonna get rid of well, geoff so he doesn't lose his job <laughs> okay geoff we'll, we'll we'll talk another time we don't want you to lose your job hey don't stay i want to stay <laughs> as a black square that fucking makes no sense i'm, I'm, I'm how, how do you turn on your video <laughs> it's called youtube go to another area of your computer watch that youtube clip and come back we're not streaming you can watch last week's episode I already have. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, Casey Corbin's here now. Well, we're talking about concerts, and we'll we'll talk to Scott first, then we'll hit you, Casey. So, Scott, just once to one story about either the best concert you ever saw, your first concert, or your worst concert. Lay it on us. Okay, best concert I best concert I ever saw was probably Grateful Dead, nineteen ninety two. Uh, just before I went to Europe, I spent. So I saw the dead four times that summer. Right. And if you've ever experienced the Grateful Dead concert, the bong hit that those guys asked you to go take in at the college day, it blows it away. <laughs> oh, did you do any, did you do any uh, whippets, nitrous oxide? No, I did not do whippets. No, 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 no much, balloons? No, pretty no. much everything. Are you allowed started. to go to a Grateful Dead concert if you don't get high? <laughs> There was out. a couple. I think there was a couple people that they did not enjoy it the same way the rest of us did. <laughs> now, when I you just, said you saw them four times in one summer, so did you go on the road for? Yeah, a week? I did. I deadheaded for about uh, three weeks after them. Wow. Yeah. Well, I know we'll get to Casey about probably Van Halen and doing that, but okay, that's <laughs> the best that you've had. Okay, so we're gonna say goodbye for this week because we're gonna bring in someone else. But you have a worst yep. of concert? Yeah. Do you have a worst of concert before you go? Uh. Just because it was so overrated, Rolling Stones uh, Steel Wheels tour. Yeah, it just it just it didn't live up to what the hype was. And they were older. They they were good, but not what I oh. expected them to be. It's almost like they're human beings. How dare they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, just, I I don't know. It was a good show, but more it was so hyped up that it just didn't live up to it. Well, that was it's that was the concert I, I went to that one and I and I that was the I think the first time that I saw them so but they hadn't been on the road in a long time since like the yeah. early and yeah uh, yeah I remember thinking that it was a good show but I had no frame of reference because yeah it wasn't uh 
Yeah, I hadn't been to that many concerts. All right, well, uh, are we are we, are we ditching your friend Jeff? He's your friend. I he's been like <laughs> yeah, trying to like, he's like in a fucking fishbowl. <laughs> yeah, uh, there he is. I don't know. I can't see anything. I got my computer all mixed up, but. <laughs> I don't know how to switch the camera. I got one on the keyboard and one on the on the uh, display. What is this? The fucking cast a cocoon? The fuck? <laughs> and Wilford Brimley died this year. Uh, well, yeah. What would you do without me? I think he, I think he's uh, his ghost is over Geoff's shoulder right there. <laughs> Eat your oatmeal. Eat your oatmeal. I'm right here. Thanks. Okay, we'll say goodbye to Scott. Thanks, Scott. All right. Okay, cheers. All right. Yep. Bye. Yep. See you, Scott. All right. So Casey. Best concert, worst concert, or first concert? Um, or all three. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, the first concert I ever saw uh, was the best way to kick it off. 1988. Um, the uh, It was uh, July uh, 10th, and it was uh, David Lee Roth with Poison. <laughs> and oh, the Eat Him and Smile was tour. A, yeah. How old are you? Was a, not the Eat Him Smile, Skyscraper. Oh, okay. uh, skyscraper tour. I was 14 years old, and uh, I remember in the in the in the seats we were in the top row at, at uh, the Ottawa Civic Center. So that's not even that bad. But um, I remember my buddy said, "You're gonna smell drugs, so you gotta <laughs> pull your you gotta pull your shirt up over your nose. Otherwise, you're gonna get stoned and not remember the show." Yeah. So halfway through the show, I'm like. I didn't want to get stoned, and like I laugh now because oh, I'm like, so dude, you that could have been you so early, you know, <laughs> uh, because I wasn't totally in the Van Halen at that point. Uh, not till like I, I liked them, but they weren't my favorite. I was actually right. excited to see Poison more than Roth at the time. Okay, right. so uh, let me just so wait, David Lee Roth was your gateway into Van Halen. Oh no, no! Technically, my gateway in a Van Halen was Michael Jackson, and beat it. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, know that. I know we don't know that story. But Michael uh, Jackson's <laughs> a gateway for a lot of things, but I didn't think it was going to be for Van Halen. But go ahead. <laughs> well, he had a he had a pension for uh, great guitarists and uh, young ass. So you know, <laughs> yes. he's a true rock star. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they. Uh, the funny thing is about the first concert was I had an adult job. I worked in a factory. I lied about my age. I said I was 15 instead of 14. And uh, I I was on the night shift at a factory uh, at Cal Info Systems. They, they manufactured discs. And um, so what I would do is I, I worked one day shift before, and then I would put on the night shift. But I couldn't do the night shift because uh, I had a Bailey Roth concert to go to. So I biked into work that morning at like 7 a.m. And I just showed up on the day shift randomly. And okay. I'm here to work my shift. And they're like, you're on the night shift. I'm like, yeah, but I can't do it. Uh, I got uh, a daily rock uh. concert to go to. <laughs> and, you know, they didn't. I, this is my first job. I had no idea. They're like, well, that's not how it works. I was like, well, I can't come into work tonight. So I'm here now. And they're <laughs> like, okay, well, we can't use you now. So just go home. And go to your show tonight, and then tomorrow we'll start your job all over again and pretend this never happened. And it was like <laughs> maybe my second or third day on the job, and I just thought, this is how it works. I'm 14. Sure. I'm just going to go to a concert. I already had it. Whatever. You mm -hmm. know, they shouldn't even hire me anyway. a factory worker at 14. I'm fucking underage. <laughs> Goddamn child laborers. Yes. No, and when you're 14 or 15 and you got concert tickets, you're like, I've quit a job because I had to go to a party once. So exactly. Yeah, you dude, know. I missed I quit doing I I quit going out for commercials because I was on a non-union shoot where they couldn't drive me back into the city and I missed a Motley Crew concert and I'm like no more commercials. <laughs> Which might be the dumbest thing ever. Um but that Especially cuz it was Motley Crew. I was so angry to that Motley Crew fucking show. Oh, and, I, so and, I, and I know the industry has taken a hard hit from you not being able to. <laughs> I, like, hey. I like how you, you shoved could have been the, the You could have been like, a Scott Power. You could have been one of the the uh, paper towel guys that's in those white suits. Yeah, oh, yeah. Or I could totally have just had a that. job more often. Um, <laughs> you know, but instead, I re I retired on my Swedish electronic 
Like it was a sweet, it was a Swedish commercial for some sort of uh, electricity thing, Swedish hydro or something like that. So <laughs> I've never even seen the commercial. Hydro, how I <laughs> Well, what? Yeah. Now, Darren, okay, we haven't gone through everybody's first concerts. I think I might. I think I need to ditch your friend, uh, Darren. Yeah, yeah, because and- yeah, just. In- This is Andy Kindler, and you're listening to Anything Goes on XM Radio, in case you had no idea what you were doing. That's what you're doing. Continue to do it. So, uh, as far as regular favorite concert goes, every time I see U2, they get better and better and better. So, the last time I've seen U2 is probably my favorite concert. But Steel Panther also do amazing fucking concerts in a total different way. And they're yeah. also my the the night after Trump was elected, I went to the Roxy in LA, and a very sad audience was there to rock out a Steel Panther, and it was just the fix we needed, and it was fucking great. And now, did uh, you ever see Steel was, Panther open for Priest because they toured together? Did no, I tour? wish I would have went to that show. That show came through the amphitheater, mm-hmm. but I didn't even know who Steel Panther were at that time, okay. or maybe I did, but I didn't really follow them as well. But I've seen them. Right. Seven times. And well, for those I who don't know who Steel Panther is, for those who don't know Steel Panther, they're like they're not they're not like a uh, a tribute band or a cover band, but no. they do their own thing. But they do it in like a nineteen eighties glam rock style, super over yes. the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They started they're, they're, as actually they're a glam they did metal band that exists today. Didn't they start? They started out as a Van Halen cover band. Yes, and then they became Steel Panther. Yeah, they and, they, and well, they became metal school in between. Yes. And then a metal school would just do covers, just a cover band. Yes. And then they became Steel Panther and started putting out their own material. Right. And it took, a, you know, they're really hip and cool in L.A., which is exactly what you want to be for a glam band in L.A. Right. You know? Yeah, it was they all used about to play, the strip. when I was living in L.A., they played at the House of Blues every Sunday, I think, across from the comedy store. And yeah. we have to go a couple of times. And sometimes it'd be super packed and sometimes it'd be like empty. Oh, but it was always okay. fun. <laughs> the greatest thing ever for me was going to Steel, Con- Steel Panther concert, bringing Michelle Shaughnessy, putting her in an Old Manolis Van Halen 1984 tour shirt from 84. And I said to her, this is going to get you noticed by the lead singer because you don't have big boobs. But what you have is a vintage Van Halen shirt. And he's such a Roth fan he will pick you before all the others to talk to. And everything went exactly how I planned it. (laughs) He's looked at her. He looked at the shirt. He took her out. He's like, what's your name? She's like, said something. He goes, what do you want to do tonight? She's like, let's fuck. And like, he's like, that's going to be the next album cover, you know, or something like that. You can watch it on YouTube. And it's Michelle Shaughnessy for a rock concert. At first, she thought she'd never been to a rock concert. So we get front and center first. And then the first kick in the head from a mosh pit guy, he's like, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> so we had to move to the side. But once she got on stage and got dancing, she made her way up to the drummer and got me a drumstick, and that's exactly what I wanted. So it's fantastic. Is it, and, and Casey, Steel wait, Panthers on me. <laughs> Casey, that's on YouTube? Yeah, you can watch it on YouTube. And if you want, I'll, I'll send you the video clip. Or the yeah, video send the link. Send the link, and we'll, we'll put it on here. Oh, Michael. No, no, it's so weird. High five. Oh, this. <laughs> yeah, it's really. She's 72 and her tits are four years old. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I got one. I got one. Yeah. Woo! Oh, that was that. <laughs> Thank you so much. You want something to drink? This is awesome. What are you drinking? Divorce yet? Someone give him something to drink. Gin and juice. Some <laughs> gin and juice. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Right, this song goes out to you. This one goes out to you. This chick's a whore. She likes the fuck. I love the fuck. Yes, I love the fuck.
so Darren, Kathleen, and Kate, like, did your did your parents ever take you to concerts? Like, yeah, my first concert was Neil Diamond with my mom. Oh wow, that is cool. Yeah. How old were you? Probably like seven. Seven. Seven or eight. Right. Yeah, it was really really young. And then a month later, my cousin took me to Paula Abdul. So I had a good. <laughs> now what? That's uh, great. Darren, you? I took. No, go ahead, Casey. What were you going to say? I took my sister to Paula Abdul as well. Yes. I had fingerless gloves and my big ponytail on the side of my head. I thought I was the coolest person ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was babysitting two 13-year-olds. So oh, yeah. <laughs> it was my job. But coloring and bad were pretty good. And then uh, <laughs> when, when they play opposites attract, who could who doesn't want to dance with Chester Cheetah? Anything right. Paula Abdul said you got to dance to. It's always yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good show. It was a really good show. Uh, Spellbound <laughs> tour, I believe. So, and what year was that? For me, I think it was uh, maybe like 91. Yeah, I like think that. You're probably. Yeah, that's what I would have said for this oh, Spellbound yeah. era. Yeah. So you, yeah, you didn't, you didn't, but Casey, back then you didn't look like the Captain Highliner Casey that you are. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That would be really creepy. You see my two 13 year old girls. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't even think I don't even think I had hair on my face at all. Hey, Casey, was... how old were you when you went bald? Like, remember when you shaved your head that era? How yes. old were you when you did that? Um, I I was going, I you shaved know. it for uh, about 90, 97. Well, I did a seventy two ounce steak and I shaved it for that. And then I went <laughs> on stage two nights later and I had a really good set. And I thought, oh, it must be the new look. Sure, so I kept it and I kept it till. 2005 before growing it out. Bald Casey was the first Casey I met. Yeah, bald Casey. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Some Jason Lawrence constantly tells me that he likes bald, hairless Casey better. <laughs> well, you better get on that. Because he didn't shed so much on his carpet, I <laughs> <laughs> um, Now, Darren, what about you? Your first one? My first concert was uh, 1986. Uh, I lived in Brantford, Ontario, which was an hour and 15 minutes outside of Toronto. And I paid to get on a bus with a bunch of, uh, it was called the uh, Booze Cruise. So this local record store would rent a, a, like a big giant bus and people would get a ride to the concert and back so they could do drugs, drink, get fucked up. And <laughs> it was uh, Judas Priest, they played the X. So we got there at like 11 o'clock in the morning, did the X all day, did the concert at night and then got back on the bus and went back home. And oh, it was yeah. Judas Priest. The Turbo Tour, 86. And you didn't... Well, awesome. And so were you with a bunch of people or were you... I was just with one friend. We just... One friend, oh. uh, maybe two, two guys. And, uh, you know, we were like... I was like 15, 16. Yeah. We should huh. never have been on this thing. Everybody was fucking high, hammered. <laughs> the, the, the driver for sure was high. Secondhand <laughs> smoke? Come on. Oh, well, you remember the, the when... Uh, who did we see? Was it, was it Judas Priest and Cinderella opened? At uh, the Kingswood uh, or the King, uh, the Molson Amphitheater, you and I, Darren. We went and saw Priest. Yeah, we saw. Yeah, it was Judas Priest. Uh, Cinderella opened. Uh, Might have been Poison too. No. And, yeah, no. What well, Judas Priest we saw. We did. So see the only times I saw Judas Priest at the amphitheater, uh, Motorhead was on the show. Testament, Heaven and Hell, and Judas Priest. Yeah. Wow. And then Great I fun. saw. Yeah. And then I saw another tour of Judas Priest. A few years before that, and um, it might have been Cinderella. You might be right there. Okay, but it wasn't poison. Cinderella. It was never I, I, poison. I'm going to be quite upset, and I'm going to change my will if you can't remember us going to uh, uh, the Judas Priest concert. The but, problem but, with the amphitheater is I when I did Gutterball Alley, which you know is a great show. If you ever want to go on YouTube and kill three hours and then yourself, um, <laughs> we were sponsored by Molson Canadian the show so we got free tickets for a whole year to the amphitheater awesome. so we could see any show every night so i, I didn't care if i liked the band or not i love people yeah. watching yeah. so i yeah. went so that was the first time i saw the indigo girls the first time i saw deep purple and leonard skinner and all these bands because it's like i don't care if they're good or not it's a night out you know i'll pay 10 bucks for a hot dog and pay to get in who well, gives a fuck and watch it but just remember i just remember seeing those fans at that judas priest concert and I don't think Priest had, had toured in a while. Right. And there was a lot of, like, classic Scarborough, FUBAR, rockers oh, yeah. came out that night. They were in the middle parking night. lot, man, for sure. That's yeah, the yeah, crowd. Yeah. There was one guy, I remember I pointed it out to him. He looked like, um, 
uh, what's that? He looked like that actor, uh, Elias Cotius, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, or Christopher Maloney from uh, Law and Order, but like long rocker hair, eyes just bloodshot. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Look at that. And, you know, and, and his eyes were bugged out, bloodshot, like 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 to the red level of Kathleen's shirt. And <laughs> he was like screaming priest, like it was a demon trying to get out of him. You don't, oh, man. Some of those Do you remember going to see Anvil? Huh? Do you remember when we went to go see Anvil? Oh, yes, and they started on time. I remember we went out uh, for drinks with a bunch of people beforehand, and we were like, yeah. oh, they're a heavy metal band. They'll be going on late. And uh, we get there, and it's what? like after through the show because yeah, we start right on time at the at the Phoenix. But we yeah. should have known though. Anvil was so excited to get to perform. Yeah, no. <laughs> and he had the vibrating dildo. That's probably now. What you just handed, held up the Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. How many times have you seen the Pumpkins live? Uh twice. twice. And were they good either one yeah. of them times? Uh, well, I I don't. I'm a fan of Billy Corrigan, so. Right. I, I don't, it doesn't matter. Like, the first time was 96 when they were in their heyday. Right. And it was amazing. And the second time was like two summers ago, I think they came through. Uh, and yeah, but two summers ago, that tour, everyone said they were on the money for that tour compared to other tours. They were yeah. really good that, that last two or two oh, years I ago. Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, because I also knew, like, I'd also been following that tour on uh, online, and there had been shows where Courtney Love had been showing up. Right, and they would play, um, they would play uh, like Celebrity Skin or a couple yep. tracks off Celebrity Skin, which is yep. also my like my second favorite Smashing Pumpkins album. Yep. So you know, yep. it, it's it's such a great album. Anyways, um, yeah. So when you guys said what the theme was, I also I went through a whole bunch of concert stubs today, and I always so anyways, I have all my stubs, and they're the majority of them, and uh, it's interesting going back through shows. And then seeing the price jump from oh my the God, 90s yeah. to oh, now. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, I saw Garth Brooks for $35. Like, wow, that my is, God. that's, that's a, incredible. I'm not a Garth Brooks fan on any level at all. Uh, His I, show's got to be amazing, though. It yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's an entertainer. He's like Neil Diamond. Yeah. I may not love Neil Diamond's music that much. A couple songs are cool. But I would yeah. go see Neil Diamond because I know when it comes to putting on a show, and I would go see Garth Brooks, too, because... That guy's a showman. I may not like his music that much, but that guy's a, a showman for sure. No, he puts yeah. on a Kiss style show. Yeah. For country music, and that's what what also made him really famous was his concerts were very rock and roll and kick ass. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'm going through my Chris Gaines uh, moment of my career right now. <laughs> so I'm hoping to maybe come back into the angry thing. But right now, you know, I'm just gonna I'm gonna Chris Gaines have an alter ego. Pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. You get some bangs, some yeah, some asymmetrical bangs. I'm just gonna go down. Casey's gonna shave his head. I'm gonna tape that hair on my head, and I'm just gonna. Like that. <laughs> yeah, and you're gonna get that uh, ridiculous soul patch that. Yeah, uh, that you tried to fucking to talk me into. I told him I'm shaving this today. He's like, no, do the handlebar the mustache handlebar. like Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I'm fucking doing that for a day. I fucking look lame day. enough. Jesus Christ, I'm not gonna fucking. Oh my god. god. Committed oh. to a wife and kids, you can't commit to like a facial. No. Your hair thing? Okay, all right. Yeah. Have you guys ever <laughs> been to uh, any cool bands that you've seen, like in a club or anything like that? I saw. Two. I got to see. I got to see uh, the 25th anniversary No Effects show. Like, so their 25th year, and all of the original members came back, and it was in LA at the Fonda, which is like a very small theater. Yep. And it was all open, and it was one of the best concerts I've ever been to it was so much I love I've seen no effect live so many times and they put on the they're they have the most fun sometimes he's totally fucked up sometimes he's not but <laughs> anytime he, in fact Mike it, it's so he's so great like I like I was big into like the California pop punk kind of like ska when I was like younger I saw real big fish like eight times they're like one of the best like small club bands to go see there's so much fun but yeah, I got to see them. But this one, sorry, I don't mean to hog all this. My friend was backpacking through Ireland and he walked into this pub and he heard a Tragically Hip song. And he's like, they played a Tragically Hip over here? And he looked and the Tragically Hip were playing in that right. bar. Yeah. And there was like 20 people there. Yep. It yeah. was crazy. Awesome. Uh, and yeah. Edmonton that's also cool. has that's a, the, story. That's the best thing about the, 
that's the best thing about the hip. Like my friends used to always say, um, you know, I used to say, oh, it's you're lucky the hip hasn't made it worldwide. You don't know how lucky you are. They used to take it as an insult. I'm like, look it, I'm a Van Halen fan. I can't drive to Boston and watch them in a fucking bar. You can. Right. You yeah. don't know how good you got it. Yes. Yeah. You can drive There's to like Albany, see them in a bar, and then the next winter see them on a theater, on a like on a on a, on a fucking full arena tour. Like yeah. you, <laughs> the, the, the I, I actually did that. Lady, we do, I drove to Chicago once to see the hip with Johnny Gardos and Scott Rondo. They were playing massive arenas here, and they were playing the House of Blues, which isn't a tiny venue, but it's under no. 2,000, and it's not a bad seat in the whole place. It was the fuck, one of the best concerts I've ever seen, yeah. and it was all Canadians, of course, the cliche, but it was a fucking kick-ass so show. Fun. It's like, so yeah. fun seeing a, exactly. a hit show in the state when you're Canadian. Like, I yes. saw them at the House of Blues in L.A., and um, it was so much fun, Like, and they yeah. were selling Canadian beer and poutine, and it was like, it was awesome. Right. The last concert I went to were David Lee Roth at the House of Blues in uh, in in Vegas. The three night, the three shows that Roth did, I was there all three nights, and that was the and then that was the last bit of fun I had before fucking everything went down. So you know, but they, they, like to see a band, a big band in a bar, like yeah. it's just so much better than seeing them in in in, uh, in, in a major arena. So yeah, there's a I legend think. in. There's a legend in Edmonton. It's not a legend. It actually happened. But there, there was a bar here that used to be called the Bronx. And, like, just before Nirvana hit it big, they played in Edmonton. And everybody says that they were there. Right. <laughs> but yeah. literally 15 people were there. But, like, everybody says that they saw Nirvana at the Bronx. But, oh. yeah, you know, um, but it, that's Dun pretty – that'd be crazy. Brooks and Dunn, when they were on tour in Ottawa – they showed up at our, we had the only country bar was the Lone Star, East End Lone Star. And that's the only country bar in Ottawa. So we were a sponsor of the tour. So they showed up at our bar afterwards. Nice. And the, they walked in, it was like, um, Brooks and Dunn, Toby Keith, and somebody else I can't remember. And they, they, they partied till like seven in the morning. And like, we were there, we were watching girls go on and off the tour buses. And it was just <laughs> hilarious. Like all these like, cougars in from the sticks you know all done up for a night they didn't even know they like they couldn't afford to go to the concert were they so all they went to the fucking all... bar and then the concert came to them it were was all... unbelievable were they all cackling like oh my husband thinks i'm staying at your place tonight <laughs> <laughs> they were all saying like, the, the, the band the band on stage was like uh yeah you can use it to sign everything on your way out can you do that for us so Brooks and Dunn would get on and play six songs and Toby Keith would get on and play six songs and the other guy got on and played four songs and it was just, wow. And there was a lot of fucking fajitas sold that night, god damn it. <laughs> I'll tell you, they used to bring in good concerts. One time they brought in April Wine and April Wine, I showed up to watch the concert and then drunkenly I went downstairs and walked through the kitchen and there was like seven, 60 wings on a platter, all hot wings. And I was like, what's... What's with these wings? They're and my crazy. buddy goes, they're April Wines wings, but they don't like them hot. And then I said, oh, yeah, I like them hot. I like them hot. <laughs> and I took the whole fucking tray of wings. I walked her to the bar and just started fucking wings. So there's a famous story. <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 the, well, the, the Nirvana thing, I went, to go the, I went to go see the Lollapalooza that Nirvana was supposed to headline. And the reason why I was asking about Smashing Pumpkins was because Smashing Pumpkins was second on the bill. Kurt Cobain kills himself, and they just moved Smashing Pumpkins up to headline it. Mm -hmm. So it was like George Clinton, the Beastie Boys, uh, wow, and uh, I oh uh, I think Green Day might have been on it. And I remember that they had uh, they had uh, No Doubt's horn section. So it was Green Day, but they had a horn section for and it was. Like those are those, those those are fun concert memories when bands sort of trade back and forth like members yeah. like that. But it was like it was kind of pissy because people were upset because it was supposed to be Nirvana was Nirvana, supposed to be Nirvana. Right. And back then I guess Smashing Pumpkins, they like turned on the audience really quick. They, they weren't not, very good then, yeah. And the Beastie Boys were amazing. And so it's like a lot of people just started leaving while Smashing Pumpkins was on. And I think Billy Corgan knew it, and he started insulting people. And it was a bit of a, it was, yeah, it was a bit. It was bad. A, 
there's a, there's a fa- there's a famous story similar to the Nirvana playing a small venue that we were talking about before. So Radiohead on their Fake Plastic Trees album, the the Bends, they played Toronto. They played a really big venue, like um that that's that what is it on right on Bloor that soccer stadium, um, um oh Bloor Bloor Avenue. Oh, Varsity Arena? Varsity Arena, that's it. Yeah. So they play Varsity Arena, which is, you know, what, six to 8,000 people. And the next night, because it's the, it's the way bands work, they'd rather work than have a night off. They played in London, Ontario at Call the Office. Now, if you've never been to Call the Office... That's the, one of the best venues in Canada. It's very iconic on for bands. It's tiny. And yeah. they fucking played the next night at Call the Office. And it's a pretty famous thing. There's a, a poster for it and everything. But it's like, you know, I talked to some of the staff like six months later. And they're like, yeah, this is how it works. You know, sometimes a band will, like I'm friends with the Headstones. One night they're playing to 8,000 people. And on the way to the Edmonton, they're stopping in Thunder Bay. And they're playing to 500 people on a Sunday night. And I'll yeah. tell you, the best show I ever saw the Headstones, it was to 200 people in a small town in Ontario. And they fucking brought it. And it's like, yeah, this is the kind of show I want to see more than Toronto with all the hanger-ons. It's the best way to see a show. 100%. And I will say, okay, I saw now Jericho's band, Chris from Jericho's band, uh, what, Fozzy? Yeah. They did a Canadian tour. And uh, on their Canadian tour, um, the the venue they were playing for Ottawa was not in Ottawa. It was in Iron Pryor. So I could right. not pass up. Go, I'd already bought tickets to Toronto, but I couldn't pass up not going to Iron Pryor to see them sure. as well. So I saw them in Iron Pryor and I saw them in Toronto. And the better show by far was in Iron Pryor. It oh. was a, it was the bar that I sell out yeah. so on my own. So like, uh, he comes in, of course, he's going to sell out. And it was packed to the tits. And on Monday night, the energy was amazing. And it was such a great, fun crowd. Because again, bar concerts are by far better than live, con- live yeah, concerts sure. any day. I I always uh, um, I always have to admit though that probably uh, if it was a comic, it's like I don't think a, a band can always bring it, but a comic is not going to bring it uh, the next gig that he does after playing Massey Hall. It's like the next gig you do after playing this huge historic match. <laughs> yeah, I think, and the next thing is like to like eighteen people at a bar. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know I'm supposed to. That's so humbling though. That's what I like about comedy. Like I. When I played Casino Rama and it was like 5,000 people and then the next time I'm at Sunday I'm at downtown Yuck Yucks for 20 people, it's humbling. You can't get too much of an ego <laughs> when you're like, oh. There's a famous story of, uh, it's either Harlan Williams <clears throat> or Norm MacDonald. I'm not sure which one it is. The night before, he kills it on Letterman. Kills yeah. it. The next night, he's in OV's, which is a biker bar in Toronto, nice. bombing horribly for 45 <laughs> minutes yeah. to the point where like the audience is like wanting to physically hurt them. I, I, I'm not, I, I can't remember this. It's one of those two guys, but it's like literally the night before on Letterman killing it, you know, Dave's saying you're so funny. And then the next night you're in a biker bar and they're like, fuck you. That, well, yeah. That's showbiz. Yeah. yeah there was, I, there was a, I forget uh, what comic was, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I think they were on like doing like the really shitty Western comic run uh, out in BC, and their and their comics episode was playing on the TV oh, yeah. in the bar. <laughs> and, uh, and they were that happened to Paul Meyerhoff. In Kelowna, we have Rolo too that told me this, but and not even purposely. He's standing by the TV trying to order, like finishing a beer, and his thing comes on, and the uh, guy goes, "Hey man, you're on." T-. And it's like, "Hey, is that you on TV?" And he's like, "Yeah, that's me." That can't be you. Fuck, that's not you, you fucker. You're here. You can't be up there. He's like, it's one of those, hey, it happens. I don't know, but it does. <laughs> that, what, I remember one night. I, Darren, I was, where was your first concert? Did you tell us your first? I did. Uh, the Judas Priest. Go ahead, Casey. Yeah. What are you going to say? Well, I well, got night, a friend Mike in. In a second. Let Casey finish. I'll tell him. Right. Well, one night I was uh, working my day job when I was a server at Lone Star. So, and, uh, they were playing the uh, the what do you call it the lead in to my comedy now where they show me doing <laughs> a joke on TV right and yeah. uh, so I hadn't seen it yet and it came on TV and I'm at a server station getting somebody something and then I'm watching it and this woman comes up to me like starts going for me I'm like hey I'm busy she's like what <laughs> and I point to the TV and she's like is that you 
I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and then she's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, it's Canadian entertainment. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, and then I just like, now what did you want? You know, now that I'm done watching myself on TV, <laughs> can I get you your fucking salsa? You know, like, it was so annoying and so, uh, you know, and it's great when you have great moments like that, real life will always bring you down and be like, this is reality. You don't get luxuries in Canadian entertainment. That's right. Yeah. Now, okay, yeah. so we'll bring in, we'll bring in Mike. We'll say goodbye to Casey. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate This is Chuck Byrne, and you're listening to Anything Goes with Darren Frost on XM. <laughs> Mike Bromley uh, lives in, uh, Wol it's called Wolf Island, which is an island right beside Kingston, Ontario. So he might have some tragically hip stories. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Dave's I favorite love band. Tragically Hip was like my first non-parent concert like when i was in junior high i saw yeah, them at the coliseum did your parents never take you to concerts darren no never so i went to rap like i my first concert i went to a raffy concert i know my mom i thought you were gonna say rap like, are you bringing in mike have you brought yeah, okay. well, bring in mike and then we can talk about raffy okay he's coming raffy. i don't know nothing man i got so high before the raffy concert no, and uh, I bought. We're some talking about Raffi, Mike. Just so you know, Dave's telling a story about his parents taking him to a Raffi concert. No, no, no story to it. But my first concert, I was like, uh, and my mom took me to it. Was like, I think I might have been like fourteen or fourteen, maybe, or and it was uh, Fats Domino and uh, it was Fats Domino and, and Roy Orbison at the <laughs> Forum in Toronto. Okay. And it was amazing. Like I was, it was my idea to go. I want. I was the one that wanted to go. Right. And, but you know, you're 14. You need mom. Parents aren't gonna. Actually, my parents would have let me go by myself and <laughs> pick me up afterwards. It's like that. That would have probably happened if I asked them to. But my mom went. Went. And it was supposed to be Jerry Lee Lewis and Fats Domino and a dueling piano sort of thing. But then Jerry Lee Lewis couldn't go, and so it was Roy Orbison. And it was like still like like late 80s so they weren't you know they weren't that old yet but they were like right but they they put on an amazing show but um i was you know it's like how long was it before you realized that judas priest had a uh, had a gay vibe going on well i mean i i knew from I mean, almost from the beginning i mean I, I didn't it didn't really matter to me but um when he announced that he was gay, that's when I was obviously, okay, fine, he is. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that whole area of music there, I mean, Skid Row, Sebastian Bach from Peterborough, Ontario, he wore a t-shirt that said, you know, AIDS kills fags dead. You know, yeah. like oh this God. is this is the whole a area of music that Rob Halford had to live in, right? So it's not surprising he just, you know, dabbled with the imagery but didn't say anything. It's just right. the, way, the way it is. Because that whole, I grew up in that era of like metal, you know, Tough wow. guy. And there's no way, you know, the fact that they didn't know Freddie was gay. And I mean, come on. Well, he was never. I mean, look at. But yeah. Look at. Uh, uh, yeah. If you see the, if you see the video for breaking the law now. Right. It's sort of like, oh, my God, how did I not know? I mean, it's they're like leather vest. They're like shirtless with like leather vests. And it's like they're working out in a gym. It's sort of like the point. I was like, I. You remember Frankie Goes to Hollywood and the song sure. Relax? Yeah. yeah. I had no idea about what the band was all about. Right. And I had no idea. I was like 13, maybe, or 14. I had no sure. idea what uh, Relax was about. And uh, and, I, and I saw that they were coming to Toronto. And I just love that song. I love the, the music, the, the bass and Relax. I thought it was such a cool song. And I, was, and I saw that they were coming to Toronto, and I wanted to go. And my and I and my parents probably would have let me go. I didn't have anyone to go with. They would have dropped me off in front of the venue, and they would have picked me up afterwards. And it never followed through. But I'm like to this day, I'm kind of glad. I don't know what like earth shattering sort of like psychological <laughs> damage that. You've been could've... fine. You had a good time. A, a thirteen year old at a Frankie goes to Hollywood yeah, concert you, in the eighties. Fine. You would have no. got a lot of high fives. No, we got I, a lot of high fives. I, I do not think so, Darren. I would have. You would have been like one of those, like, ki like the the twelve year old kid that goes to university, and they'd be like, "Look at this yeah. cute kid." Yeah, you're around. like Gary Coleman and all those movies in from the eighties. 
<laughs> wearing a no, suit I, to a concert. <laughs> I would, I would All right, let's it. let's say, let's say hi to Mike. Mike, we're talking concerts. First, concert. really, I had I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> yeah. like, Best concert. All of you, yeah, you Where's you guys that? are much younger than me, obviously, because uh, my concert experience is very different. Very so your first people. concert was Mozart? Is that what you're telling me? Or <laughs> No, you know what? My first concert well, was the freebie ones because it was like, I think it was beginning of high school. Right. And uh, they used to have these concerts at Nathan Phillips Square. And uh, the first guy I ever saw was the Mighty Pope. And uh, you probably, you'll have to Google that, but he was a big thing back then. I think he was the first one that came out wearing a cape. He was a black guy. So oh. that was a freebie thing. Oh, I actually you know, you thought you meant the Pope. With, I actually thought you meant the Pope. Top, <laughs> tube tops were very big in the 70s, very right. big in the 70s. So the trick was to have a busty girlfriend, and then you had to run because you were late for the concert, and that tube top was not the most secure thing a girl could wear and as a teenage boy that was the thing you just yeah. go to the freebie concert and that was it no, and i know, know that darren your taste in music is totally different than mine um the 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 big concert that i waited for was harry chapin at oh, harry uh, chapin's at, awesome at massey hall and it was phenomenal his live shows were great um but the heavy metal i don't know yeah i don't know yeah, but I was now, the, the, 13. How old is Kathleen? Uh, I just turned 40. Now, Kathleen. And I just got oh vaccinated. My God. <laughs> oh, my Kathleen, God. You, you look like. like all, all that matters is what age you can play on TV. Yeah. You look like you're oh. in your 20s. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> my what God. Was, what was your worst show that you ever saw then? The worst of a band that we might know or a performer that we might know? Is there one? Oh, there's, I mean, <laughs> the, the worst band that I ever saw was actually at a Mike Bullard show, Swollen <laughs> Members. It was horrible. It was horrible. Oh. Mike Bullard was horrible. Mike Bullard is a horrible person. <laughs> and it's, and Swollen Members, I mean, I can't think of a band with a more fitting name. They, they were, I, I just, I couldn't believe well, for, it. First of all, well, it's not really, that's not the best environment to see any kind of band on that show. Trust me, I saw, I was there for many, many episodes, and I saw a lot of great bands not come across well. The sound isn't good. The aesthetics wasn't good. I'm not defending Swollen Members. I'm just saying if that's your, yeah, yeah, the, the Mike Bullard show was not a great show for bands. No, but also also in, uh, in defense of the hip-hop genre, it never really comes out that well in concert. It's sort of like their stuff is so studio based that it's sort of like it, you don't. Know, there's not a lot of hip hop concerts that translate well to stage. That's what I found. But he, but I did see Public Enemy well, at, uh, at the Opera House uh, on uh, Queen Street. I saw Public Enemy there, and they they did an all right job. And I saw the Beastie Boys at uh, fucking uh, Varsity Arena, and Henry Rollins opened up for them, which was quite exciting. And I've never seen fans scream, you know, fuck you, Henry. That was just, <laughs> that's a positive response at a Henry Rollins concert. <laughs> who's the most who's the most talented musician that you've seen? Oh, uh, I'll answer that first. I'll say Beck, in my opinion. Beck? Yeah. What about you, Darren? Well, when it comes to talent, um, even though I'm not a fan of them, I saw Deep Purple live. They were very, very good musicians. Um, I also thought, uh, I also think the Indigo Girls are very good musicians. Yes. Yeah, so I'll stop with those two. Those I saw Christina cute. Aguilera and I was blown away. Like, I wasn't expecting much. I just got tickets uh, for a Christmas present or something. But she did an acapella version of Beautiful, and I was like crying. Yeah. Her voice is oh, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Her, it was such her, a great show. Her voice is phenomenal, like phenomenal. But I, hands down, the best musician I've ever seen, and I, whenever I get a chance to see him, and that's Bruce Hornsby. Uh, Bruce Hornsby yeah. is totally different live than anything that's recorded, and it, it's just amazing. I mean, you can. 
you hear his brain working and it just gives you an appreciation for for now, music what did that he I tour with because he toured with a really big band for a while. Well, he, he was, toured with the Grateful Dead, right? Uh, and but I mean, when he played Toronto the first time, he he opened for Bonnie Raitt, and I'm not a Bonnie Raitt fan, right? But after that concert, it was like it was just really good. You can hear Hornsby playing, and it doesn't matter what he plays; someone else's music, but you know that it's him that's playing it. He just has a way of doing it, and I mean that's why it, live music is no different than live comedy. It's just, yeah. it, you have to actually experience it in the moment to appreciate it. And once you do that, well, then you can appreciate the recorded stuff once you've well, seen I mean, it live. Yeah, I mean, but a, a musician will get a, an applause break after every song. We will always not get a laugh or an applause break after every song. That's hey, why speak, I, for I, yourself, I, Dave. Uh, <laughs> speak for yourself, Dave. Speak for yourself, Dave. I'm speaking for you, Derek, so you don't Thank have you. to. All right. Thank you. <laughs> but, I, mean, like, I, might have, I might have scoffed at, like, Bruce Hornsby, because I only know Bruce Hornsby with the range. I don't know oh. Bruce Hornsby on his own. But when you say that he's so much different in concert, like, is he, is it, pop, like, what's he doing in concert that's not so different from, well, it's, don't say, okay. oh, it's just the way that he does it. No, no, no. <laughs> End of the Innocence, okay? End of the Innocence is like a two-and-a-half-minute radio song. Yeah. But End of the Innocence, in a live performance, it starts out as like a jazz piece that he there's no singing, and he'll play for like 15 minutes. And and it's like you, you hear the song develop, a few chords here, a couple notes there. And because you know his music so well, it's like, I think this is End of the Innocence. And yeah. It's just yeah, phenomenal. It's like the he's a musical genius, and I just love I love his stuff. I like people that do anything well, even if it's not something that I like. Yeah, it's just the appreciation and that they've perfected it. And I mean, that's what that's what turns my crank. Have you ever and seen I, Ben Fold? I, uh, I have, you know. Yeah, I saw no. Ben Folds open for Beck. They open for Beck. I saw Ben Folds. He came to Edmonton twice, and he played with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. And for the first half, he plays by himself, and then the second half, he plays with the orchestra. And both times, he wrote a song live on stage with the orchestra, and it was, like, the best show ever. He's He is a very talented musician. Like, he very is, talented. like, really – and he's – I love Ben Folds, like, all of his stuff. But, yeah, that – watching him create – songs live on stage it was pretty cool no i'm i, I know i said i scoffed at at at, uh, at bruce hornsby but it just made me sort of ask want to ask like is there a concert that you if you had free tickets to a, a concert is there any concert that you would not go to like i would probably i think i would probably go to just about any concert if the tickets were free just to see the presentation of it you know it's yes like, yes hey you yes. don't have to stay you don't have to stay but I I don't know. I, to me, and maybe it's an age thing, but it's kind of the venue. Like, if I could uh, choose the venue, like anything in Old Massey Hall, I I like that. The acoustics there are, are fantastic. But there's other places where I just wouldn't want to do it. I don't like concerts that are like festival seating. Yeah. Um, yet I went to the Ottawa Folk Festival for the sole reason that Hornsby was playing. And, you know, I sat 10 feet from the stage and it was totally different. It was just that made it worthwhile. But the other, you know, folk type music, it's like, no, I just the live Hornsby, you, you, if you've never seen him live, go and listen to it. And even if you don't like his music, his musicianship is fantastic. Okay, well, my... And, and, can I just say that I mean clearly, clearly you're a fan, and clearly you have your uh, your. Uh, clearly, Dave has an issue. <laughs> you, you have your you have your uh, you have your computer angled in such a way that we don't see all the large life size cutouts of Bruce Hornsby you have around. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, Dave, but, but to be clear, point, to be clear, point, this is this no, no, is no, an no, iPad no. Pro. It's an iPad Pro. You made an issue about that last time. This is this is a Pro and. And you see, okay, with well, a perm, you can go like this, and you know, like can't. Okay, look at that. Well, I get it. I, I know. I'm not. 
I'm not trying to device shame you. I'm just saying you have a way that we can't see all your Bruce Hornsby memorabilia or the shrine. But what I guess what I'm saying is, but when you were that close to him, like 10 feet away, as much as you're a Bruce Hornsby fan, did you ever have it go through your head? Uh, I am so close to him, I could punch him in the head right now. Did that no. ever go through your head? No. No. No, it's not. It's not like a Darren Frost concert at all. It's right. a okay. totally <laughs> different vibe. It's, it's like fine. over at Darren's house. Damn straight. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm, I'm just 10 feet away from... <laughs> I got to fucking take Harry Chapin out I, one swing. Yeah. And I got it... I, oh, and at the Harry Chapin thing. Harry Chapin, I went to every single Harry Chapin concert, and uh, Darren's been to Wolf Island, so something that Darren might not be aware of is that um, Chris Brown lives on Wolf Island, and he has a recording studio. Like and the one that beat Rihanna? Yeah. No. Different no. Chris oh, Brown. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, Chris, everyone would, would want to shake his hand. <laughs> but we get musicians here that are like quite famous and then some that aren't quite famous and on the way up. And, you know, it's Wolf Island and they can come over on the U.S. ferry when we don't have COVID and nobody bothers them. So you get to actually talk to them about their lives and stuff like that. Just shoot the shit. And... Uh, I was in the, the Island Grill one evening and this woman walks in. It's like, she looks really familiar, but I know I don't know her and she's not from the Island. And then someone says, do you want to meet Jen Chapin? And it's like, I don't know who's Jen Chapin, Harry Chapin's daughter. It's like, Oh my God, like, sure. So I got to talk to her. And of course, here's like the daughter of a famous guy. So she's heard all these stories but I have a really phenomenal memory for fine detail. And I was telling her about the one concert that I'd seen and, and uh, what had happened and how her father reacted and how it just, it, it was a miraculous kind of concert because of the way he interacted with, with the audience. And uh, she appreciated that story. But the thing was that when she got back home to New York and she started talking to her mother about this guy, who talked about this concert, his, uh, his wife said, oh my God, your dad told me about that concert because it's the only concert he was ever at where he actually had a heckler. Like there was a guy that was drunk <laughs> in the upper balcony. That and was Harry Dave was, Martin. Yes, that was he, Dave Martin. <laughs> I know. I, he was just, I it was just screaming Freebird all the time. It was just play cats Freebird. in the cradle. Play <laughs> cats in the cradle. <laughs> It was just, it was so, yeah. it was so nice to have a concert experience like that. You sound and, like shit, uh, Bruce Hornsby. That's yeah. right. You're no Hornsby. Yeah. Quit the yapping and sing Cats in the Cradle. Yeah. I I have to, I have to tell a, a, a Darren Frost uh, a comedy venue story. Yeah, we've got um, like two or three minutes, Mike, but go ahead. Go ahead. Well, why do you have oh, to talk about a crime that has just been, is this a cold case <laughs> file that's, that is now implicated. Yes. Now yes. I, I'm a, I'm a single guy, and oh, uh, this story starts out weird. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. There was a woman, and you know, it would take me ten minutes to tell you the whole story. But I, she wanted to go on a date, and I didn't want to go on a date. And it's like, oh, so Darren had this uh, comedy venue at this shithole in Oshawa. It was a New Year's Eve thing. New Year's Eve, Oshawa. Never, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And they're never good. Yeah. And it's like, we go in there and it's like, Jesus, like hardly anyone has showed up for this thing. And we're seated at the front, like close enough that like Darren would be able to hear you talking and you're not supposed to be talking during this thing. This woman had absolutely no etiquette of how to behave. She's from Oshawa. Well, She's a nut bar. Yeah. And... And Darren was like, you know, he's doing his thing. And, you know, I, I, you know, I'm laughing here and there. But then I really started laughing there. because, because, yeah, it's it's, he's doing there. well. I'm laughing yeah. here and there. Yeah. But she starts saying things to me. And Darren shoots his eye. And you probably don't even remember this, but he shoots over. Oh, and I it's remember. Like, yeah. He's glaring at this. And her name is Janice. That's important to remember, Janice. So, he glares at Janice, 
And that just kills me because if I was in Darren's spot, I would have come over and talked to her with the mic like a foot from her face and go like, I'm sorry, dear. I can't hear every word you're saying. I'm hearing every other word. And, you know, like it would just piss me off so much. And because I could see the, the rage in Darren's, oh, yeah. and he had just started, you could see he was going to try to give it, like, maybe she'll calm down. And I said, like, just, shh, shh. and she just kept going. She wouldn't fucking shut up. I laughed so hard. It was, it caused other people in the room to laugh, <laughs> but it wasn't, I, I couldn't even hear what Darren was saying because I was laughing and she kept saying, I don't get it. What's so funny? Like, what's so funny? <laughs> This woman, <laughs> this woman, the name of this I don't, I, I didn't have to go on another date with her after that. That's Bro. my job. <laughs> That's my job. That's my show. But she had my yeah. phone number. She had my phone number and she called me like a year later at seven o'clock in the morning and it's FaceTime. And normally that's my daughter from Toronto. So I click FaceTime and it's like, this is friggin' Janice. And it's like, <laughs> Uh, she goes, oh, I, I, I didn't mean to call you this time. Uh, uh, I go, well, did you want to say something to me? She goes, well, yeah, but I didn't really want to FaceTime. She goes on to tell me that she went on this dating site and, um, you know, she, um, she met somebody and she shouldn't have trusted him and I should go get tested. Oh, and I no. Go, and I go, Damn straight. And I go, you fucked Janet? <laughs> Tested. No, that's the thing. That's the scary thing. Oh, she goes. You don't even have to fuck Janice. She's again. got. She's yeah. got herpes. And I said, Janice, we never slept together. We didn't kiss. I didn't even hold your hand in your mouth when you weren't looking. <laughs> no. And she goes. She gets. She gets angry. Yeah. And she goes. Well, you can tell yourself that if you want. Oh. And it's like. And then she hangs up on me. Oh. It's like, how many oh, people do you have to sleep with where you can't remember who you slept with? And she's calling people to tell them to go get tested. Yeah. Like, Darren, I would think you were closer to her for some of that thing than I was. So you should get tested. You should tested. get tested. <laughs> right. Yeah. Fucking right. Yeah. I can't wait. Well, we should yeah. get out of here, but okay. talk a whole lot. Uh, and let's all go get tested, okay? Right? Yes. Yeah, so on that note, let's all get tested. Okay, yeah. goodbye, I'll send you the uh, Bruce Hornsby stuff so you can uh, listen to it. Yeah, yeah, send a link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think it'll be okay. Dave, you're rude. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I'm not a Hornsby man. No, be you have to be gentle because he he, he has. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Dave, <laughs> kick him out. I guess I did. Well, it's just a matter of time. <laughs> sorry about that. Well, Bruce you are, you are very anti Hornsby. You. I, well, yeah, I, why do you hate him so much? Well, uh, Jesus Christ, it turned into the fucking Bruce Hornsby show. It was like, I mean, anyway, can you name one other song than uh, That's Just the Way It Is song? or The End of the Innocence. End of the Innocence. I think that is the Just the Way It Is song. No. No, those are two different songs? No, The End of the Innocence, he co-wrote that with Don Henley. He oh. brought the piano to that song to Henley, and Henley added his lyrics. Oh. Duh, Dave. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess I've been under, living under a rock. I'm sorry. The, the, the reality, honestly, is is that the, the sad part is that Bruce Hornsby is an amazing musician, but he's like Ben Folds. He's only known for that one song. Yeah. And if, if Ben Folds is only... If everyone only knows Brick... And think that's They're his whole stupid. career. Oh, that's not even close to his top right. 10 song. And the same thing with Bruce Hornsby. The way it is, that was, you know, an adult contemporary song yeah. that got him noticed. But he's a much more accomplished musician. And that's the problem. It's um, the same I'm gonna analogy as Ben Bruce Hornsby. I'm going to listen to Bruce Hornsby and then I'm going to call Dave at 4 in the morning and play Bruce Hornsby. <laughs> I'm going to call Dave at 7 and say, you should get tested. <laughs> Because I just listened to a lot of Hornsby, baby. The Bruce Hornsby vaccination, yeah. No more Hornsby beyond us. <laughs> but I, okay. I, 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 I had a couple. You know what? The one thing the guy did say about, like, concert venues and, like, festival seatings. Yeah. Uh, I went to go and see Sloan when they were doing, um, uh, what's it? Uh, one chord uh, to another, the whole album. To another, yeah, the whole album. Yeah. I See, that's how I know you, Dave, yep. Yeah, and uh, uh, so, but if you, you can pay an extra 10 bucks and go upstairs to the VIP at the Phoenix, and you got, like, leather couches that you're sitting yeah. on. 
you have yeah. your own bar. Yeah. And I was going to mention that, like, I'm just, I'm kind of at an age where it's like, I got to have a seat. Yes. I'm not going to yeah. stand for a whole show. Yeah. Even yeah. if, even if the, even if you stand for some of it, I'm not going to stand for a whole, bunch. but like both the who that I saw that I actually camped out for tickets for the who. We didn't even talk. Well, I wanted to ask Casey, have you ever camped out for tickets? But oh. Bruce Hornsby was in a priority. So. I saw the Who with a guy. And it was our first date, and his parents were there. Oh, so weird. Oh, that's how, how so weird. Were you rocking out with his parents? Well, I guess so. I don't know. Oh. It was the Who. It was a good concert. I wasn't paying attention to his parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it was when I was in Vancouver. But I can't right. for Who tickets, anyways. All right. I gotta go walk these dogs. They're driving me nuts. And yeah. Jeremy Jerry has to go walk Dave, dogs too. Yeah, and Dave, you you try to edit that Hornsby out. Which one? I'm just saying all this talk about Hornsby. You want this to be a Hornsby free episode? <laughs> no, I don't care. Okay. Yeah. No, leave it in. I yeah. love the, the I love the slow rage that builds in Dave. That was yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, well, my lips were very pierced. I was very trying very hard not to freak out. Like we we were getting off Hornsby, but you kept bringing it back to Hornsby. Yeah, you kept That's bringing what, it back. I know, That's it why it was like, weird. It was like, it's like you lecturing me after I dealt with a shitty crowd and I keep going back to the shitty yes. people in the audience. Yes. And then you're taking me aside. You're while like, you're like well, let me ask you this. You are 10 feet away from him. I'm like, don't yeah. go back to it, Dave. Like, would you, you punch him in the face? I'm like, well, where, I where to are get, you going I, with that? I'm sorry. I wanted to bring a funny moment to the show about punching Bruce Hornsby. But <laughs> I was like, no, you got to give Bruce a Oh, chance. that's Dave. That's Dave showing it. That's the way it is with Dave. 